Oh, welcome to 1251 EDN, and here we are in week seven. So, moving along through the course at a rapid pace now, and we're over halfway. And I have with us Christina, uh, Christina and Stephen, and I probably pronounced that wrong, didn't I, Christiana? Um, and, right. for the, and for those of you watching online, um, unfortunately for this week, I didn't enable Q&A correctly. Um, so if you've got questions to ask online as you watch, please use the, the Today's Meet link. So you'll find the, the Today's, Meet le Today's Meet link on the um, course website, just under where you're viewing the um, video. And if you click on that, it'll open up a page where you can put in questions and ask things there. So this week we're talking about virtual reality, augmented reality, and assistive technologies. So, Christiana and Stephen, do you have any questions about what you read about this week? Uh, not really. I, I don't know. <laughs> it was a little bit confusing, but... Yeah. Well, that's what we're here to try to clarify. So, have you ever had an experience of augmented reality? I think when the 3DSs came out, they had like those little picture cards um, that brought to life other things on the 3DS, but other than that, not really. Yep, well, that's a good example. And could you think about how they might be able to be used in a classroom? They could be implement games, um, like mathematics or English or something like that with the characters or new shapes, something like that? Yes, you could use... Um, both of those approaches have been used. Where the idea of the cards are that you can place them on the desk and using your mobile viewer or your webcam, they can then represent some sort of object in the virtual world um, and you can then move them around. So for example, it's been a good one where you have a card for each of the planets in the solar system and then the students place those out on a table in the correct locations and then using your viewer when you look through your mobile device at them um, you actually see the planets and the students can then make sure that they're arranged in the correct order and you can move them around the suns and often they'll have animations whereby you can see the moons moving around the actual pla the animated planets and it makes it more engaging for students to think about in that term. Um, likewise, parts of the human body. Um, you can have different cards for the different parts of the human body and putting them all together in the right order and sequence, um, when they look through the viewer, they'll actually see the human or, or the organs in the human body um, in their correct locations. So while we could do those with physical models, and certainly that's been done in the past in science labs and so forth, um, having the just some printed cards is obviously a lot cheaper than having the expensive plastic models of the various organs and things of that nature. The other advantage of having them digital is that they can become interactive. So you could touch on the heart and it could actually start pumping um, and animating. And so that's things that you couldn't generally do with a physical model. Um, a few other advantages are that sometimes you can have it have them so that they can detect whether or not they're in the right order. And so if students have, haven't arranged the organs in the correct order, then it will let them know. Um, sometimes you might even have it so when the blood flows, it flows through all the different parts of the circulatory system. Um, and if they're in the wrong order, then you can have the blood spurting out. Um, so again, things that you couldn't do necessarily with a phys physical model, that you can fairly easily animate and have done with a augmented reality model. So can you think of any other concepts in any of the subjects that you're teaching? So which are the two sub which are the subjects you guys are teaching or wanting to teach? Uh, math and science. <clears throat> yep, okay. So um, it's math, maths and physics. Mm -hmm. So what about some, some mathematics ones? Can you think of how we could use augmented reality for the teaching of mathematics? Yeah. Um, All I can think of is adding apples or something like that. <laughs> Sorry, adding apples. <laughs> um, just like 
two apples plus three apples. Okay, yes, you could you could <laughs> use the cards to do some simple things like that. Um, probably um, it's most. I'll oh, go on. Three D three D modeling of like finding area or stuff like that with um cubes and or not. If you can see it in a three D sort of way, a lot of kids. Um, understand it a lot better than a 3D image just on a flat piece of paper? Absolutely. Particularly when we can actually manipulate those objects. So for example, yeah. say we're doing the area and instead of having an area made up of lots of little triangles and putting those together, so you calculate out the area of one small triangle and then use that to replicate out across lots of triangles, um, being able to move those triangles around easily and then say morphing them into squares and how then calculating out area using lots of little squares could be um, done. And so there's a whole range of different things around geometry that work very well with augmented reality. Um, of course, the computer can then interpret where these objects are placed and actually do the calculations as well and give students um, advice on how correct or incorrect their solutions are, which, you, unless the teacher goes around and does that, students can't generally get that feedback um, directly. So other things you could look at doing are things that might be impractical, such as say um, the idea of uh, Euclid's lever, where if you have a lever large enough you can move the world. Well in augmented reality we can, we can create a virtual lever and we can even create a virtual world and show that we can actually then move different um, objects um, based upon the length of the lever and how much force would be need, needed to then move um, an object um, depending upon where the fulcrum is placed and all that sort of stuff. Now those sort of things you can quite easily do in augmented reality. So having a virtual elephant is quite easy to do whereby obviously in a real classroom you can't bring in too many elephants. Okay so any other uses of augmented reality? Um, you'll see these used a lot in museums and science centres. If you go to any science centre nowadays, you'll see lots of augmented reality um, displays and interactions, um, and a lot of museums are now doing it. Okay, the example I mentioned was around floodlines in Brisbane, whereby they created a big augmented reality exhibit, um, whereby you could go in and look at your suburb, and hold up a little card which showed an interactive map of your suburb that you could move around, and then change the level of the flood on that. So it was a good way of students learning about um, coordinate systems and the impact of different levels on a contour map by filling in water. Um, okay, so how about some of the other examples we looked at? Well, one thing I mentioned, or I had included in the readings fairly early on, was the idea of telepresence. This is whereby you could have a, um, a video camera in your classroom whereby students can watch you instead of actually being physically present. So for example, if they're um, at home and sick, um, that could be set up in your classroom so that they can still experience being in your class, um, but not actually there. A little bit like we're doing here with video conferencing. But telepresence taken to its more extremes is also including the camera on a robot whereby students can move around the classroom and the playground and talk to each other um, and see through the eyes of the robot even though they're sitting at home in their beds. Um, and that's actually been deployed in a number of schools, um, particularly when students are hospitalized and being able to still participate in the school um, even though they're not able to actually physically be there. Now it's even being done with teachers. In Japan there's a, um, a, at least one teacher who teaches via telepresence and in her case she's actually got instead of a robot in her other classrooms she's actually got a robot represent uh, a, uh, a mannequin robot representing themselves or an android so it looks like her and the students interact with the robot um, even though she's many hundreds of kilometers away in another school so there's a whole range of new devices being developed around the concept of telepresence what do you think about that as a concept Um, well, I don't know, because I think I mentioned before that it would be hard to control, say, some uh, like a primary school class or something like that with just that kind of presence. 
Yeah. Um, they wouldn't really take it seriously or they could sort of figure out what they can get away with and be distracted in that way. Absolutely. And we know that students do that in with real teachers, so certainly they'd continue to do that with um, any virtual teachers or robotic teachers. Um, in the main, however, you'd find in those sorts of classrooms there would be a teacher aide or a non-expert teacher who would be there to help behaviour management issues. Um, because, yes, students don't always do exactly what we'd like them to do, um, even in very... Uh, even, even in classrooms in Asia where they are very well behaved, um, they still will get up to things if they're not monitored and their behavior isn't managed. But you will find, particularly in some of our senior subjects like physics and advanced maths, um, whereby we simply can't get teachers into all of our schools, that a lot of these technologies are being explored. Um, I actually had the case it was 10 years ago now where we couldn't get a physics teacher for our school. Um, and I put forward the proposal that we could actually have 10 PhD, student, or PhD qualified physicists from India um, teleconference in and work one to one with our students um, on their curriculum um, for, the, for the same cost as it would have been to hire a, a physical classroom teacher. But that was probably a bit bit ahead of its time at that stage and we didn't progress with that. But nowadays the idea of bringing in experts from outside the classroom through teleconferencing or other means such as the um, telepresence is becoming more and more popular. And you may find yourselves in your careers as specialist teachers in mathematics or physics or the other sciences um, in such demand that you do have to teach across many schools. Um, a lot of teachers now are teaching students in more than one school and using various technologies can assist you in that. Indeed, in America, and there's a couple of states in America whereby it's mandated that students have to do at least some of their courses online um, using those means. And I visited um, Vancouver a couple of years ago. There, students, um, even though they are physically in your classroom, have got the choice of any teacher teaching anywhere within the district of Vancouver um, online. So they may decide that you're not a particularly good physics teacher, but they know there's a good physics teacher two schools down. They're going to study with that physics teacher, sit in your class, um, but work online with that other physics teacher. Um, so that gives students a lot more choice and a lot more power and control over the classroom environment and puts a lot more pressure on teachers to actually attract and retain their students. Um, so what do you think about that sort of environment? It's really different from when I was in high school. <laughs> um, but I, I kind of like it in that if you don't engage so well with one of your teachers that you can look for um, help elsewhere, I think that's quite good. Um. Absolutely. It does benefit some students, um, but it does change the, the dynamics of the classroom yeah. environment that we've been used to. Now Definitely. Just as a reminder for those watching online, um, the Q&A isn't working today, but you can use the Teach Meet link on the course website to ask questions of the panel and myself. Um, so please go to that link on the course website, follow it to t today's meet, and you can ask your questions in that forum. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about QR codes and those sort of tags. Um, you'll find that most textbooks now will come with a whole lot of QR codes embedded in them. So as they're looking at their physics textbook and they come to a section whereby Traditionally, there might be a diagram. They can use their QR code to scan over that and then see an animated diagram or a video clip or other or a website or other resources that they can engage with um, as they're reading the actual textbooks. And indeed, some textbooks now are being written so they only work through um, augmented reality. So every single page of the textbook, you hold up your viewer device um, 
and you look at it and it'll have a whole lot of interactions and animations and movie clips and so forth. There's certainly a lot of storybooks now being written around that approach and more and more there's textbooks that are incorporating that. So you almost certainly, uh, particularly for science, come across um, QR codes and augmented reality aspects in your textbooks and you need to know how to integrate those. Now obviously if you've got a class where they've all got iPads or um, other tablet devices or laptops with webcams built in, then that's no problems at all. They can just hold up their textbook to their device and they'll be able to see the animations on their screens. So what do you think about that? That'll save a lot of pages in books physically and um, I think they're slowly moving towards just internet access so um, most textbooks will probably be online in the next five or ten years. Uh, there won't be many physical ones so the, I guess the QR codes are there to sort of um, segue into that? Absolutely, yes. And you're right, as we move to fully online then we won't need this sort of level of augmented reality. Um, although sometimes there is a, some advantage of the, of the blend of physical and virtual that we can engage with with augmented reality. Um, the other aspect is around teachers creating their own augmented realities. So if you're creating worksheets and other resources, um, not just creating the print-based material, but also creating your own animations or video clips and embedding those um, with augmented reality tags and so forth into your worksheets. Um, now the most easy way to do that is through um, QR codes. So if you've got a great YouTube clip that you want students to look at, yes, you could give them the, the link and they can go through and follow that. Or you could put on the Q, QR code on the actual worksheet and as students get to that, they could scan it and see the video and so forth. Um, some teachers also use the QR codes to provide feedback. So as you come to a particular problem, you might have created a video of yourself explaining how to do that problem. They scan the QR code, sit, watch the video of you explaining how to work through the problem, and then work through the problem themselves. Um, so integrating QR codes as an augmented reality aspect into the worksheets you create and other resources that you create can be a solution. Likewise, it can be done by your students. If they're doing assignments and all projects um, and they've got video clips or um, Google Map um, interactions and other things that they've created, they can incorporate those into their submissions to you through the use of QR codes. Now creating your own augmented reality can be a bit of a challenge because sometimes it's, it's quite an involved process, but there are some really useful tools that allow you to do that easily. Now probably the, the, the most powerful one is um, a program called SketchUp. Now this is a free download um, that you can uh, get and you can then create your own 3D models. And in fact you can just download existing 3D models of just about anything you can imagine. There's millions of objects that have been created by others and shared. So if you want to, if you're doing a experiment about dropping up some things off the Leaning Tower of Pisa, you could bring up this virtual Leaning Tower of Pisa model. Um, you could even put it as a QR code on the floor and have students see a virtual um, Leaning Tower of Pisa um, in their classroom. And then you could drop things from the top of it and see if they land on the ground at the same time. Um, and things of that nature. So there's ways of incorporating uh, real life models into what they're doing. But if they're doing things particularly around geometry again, um, they're looking at the, the volume of a pyramid versus the volume of cones and other objects, um, they could create those in um, SketchUp or another 3D modeler and then use the tools to measure um, the actual volumes and circumferences and diameters and all the rest that you might be interested in teaching them about. Um, another big aspect that I've used is around vectors, um, having students explore how model spacecraft work by applying different vector forces to a spacecraft and seeing how it moves and can um, adjust its trajectories. Orbital motion is another good one that can be modeled quite effectively in augmented reality. Now you can do these things on a computer screen as well, just using animations and apps and so forth that having that physical aspect can often be engaging for, for many students. 
Um, even so far as doing it as part of science experiments. Um, you can have a augmented reality Bunsen burner and augmented reality beakers and you put the various tags together and through the viewer you're seeing the actual experiment occurring even though you're only physically moving around pieces of paper. And when the, the tags are identified as close to another, so um, well one good one I've seen is where you're mixing various chemicals together and particularly for making explosives and so forth. So they move the tags around and put them together and the experiment then occurs, so the, or the reaction occurs. Um, now obviously there are certain things we don't want students reacting um, or putting elements together within a classroom environment, but using augmented reality approaches we can allow them to do those things and see the consequences of those um, reactions, whereby we couldn't allow them to do that in a physical space because of the safety issues. Um, similarly to do with radioactive substances, having them use augmented reality ra radioactive sources and an augmented reality Geiger counter to measure those sources and putting various um, materials again as augmented reality materials in between those two sources um, or the source and the detector can allow them to do those experiments whereby in a real classroom environment we'd be limited to the radioactive sources that we could actually utilize. Okay, so still waiting for some questions from those watching online. I can see there's a few of you watching, but not seeing many questions come through on the today's meet. So please pop your questions in there and we'll answer them. Okay, one thing I didn't mention too much about in the videos and so forth is virtual reality. Has anyone had any, any experience with virtual reality? I think, the, I think the only time was when I was in time zone and there was a thing that you put on your head and you move around and you, I don't even remember what it was, like you were shooting down yep. things or something, I don't know. <laughs> yes. Now a lot of them have come about through computer gaming. Um, so who can explain the difference between augmented reality and virtual reality? Isn't virtual reality a, the complete... Um, sort of digital world com compared to augmented where it's a mixture between the real world and the, and a digital projection onto it? Absolutely correct. So um, in virtual reality you've got to create the entire world that people would interact with and so you could create a virtual science laboratory um, and it would be completely 3D modeled and as you moved around that virtual environment, um, you could then see virtual equipment and interact with them and all the rest. Um, in an augmented reality environment, you would, you would see the real, you might walk into a real science laboratory, but you wouldn't necessarily see the equipment, and the equipment would be virtualized, um, but the rest of the space would be physical and real. Um, so there is a resurgence of interest in virtual reality and virtual reality in classrooms. There's been a whole lot of new um, equipment brought out, um, little virtual reality headsets that you can put on um, that are quite low cost and in fact the developers of that have just been bought out by Facebook. So Facebook's paid a whole lot of money to actually develop virtual reality and so we'll probably see a whole lot of interesting applications coming out very soon that link social media with virtual reality. Um, but the use of virtual reality has been applied to classrooms for a long, long time. Um, I actually did it, use, I had some virtual reality headsets in my very first couple of years of teaching, um, 15 years or so ago now, and we used them to explore various virtual worlds that the students created, um, and, and it's never really taken off in education because the cost of the headsets was a bit high. At that stage they were about $5,000 each, now they, nowadays they're around about $1,000 each, but it's still a little bit too high for widespread classroom application. Um, but we do have uh, many schools that are exploring the use of virtuality on a small scale. Uh, could anyone think about how they could utilize virtuality in your own teaching? You could actually be inside a space shuttle? Yes, absolutely. So, actually, and indeed, that's actually one thing I've done. Um, 
I actually ran a, um, a three month long project whereby we trained up a whole lot of year five astronauts and the U11 and 12 students created a spaceship and all the different controls and uh, computerized paneling and instrumentation that they would use. And we had two virtual reality headsets and they were used for their spacewalks. So they, the students went into an airlock, put on their virtual reality um, headsets, um, dressed in big spacesuits and so forth. And it was all simulated so that they left the airlock and actually walked out into space and saw the spaceship behind them and saw the Earth below them and the stars and all the rest and had that experience of being um, leaving a spaceship and going into outer space. Um, so you, you can use them for simulations and for engagement with activities like that and they can be a great way of um, helping students come to grips with places where they couldn't physically go in the real world. Um, another one I've seen used is going inside a, a cell, um, going inside a plant cell, going inside a, an animal cell and actually seeing the various elements of the cell and being able to touch them and sort of um, explore them in a way that's quite different to watching it on a video or um, seeing it in a textbook as a, as a still image and things of that nature. So there's often creative ways of having it as an experiential process, um, particularly around things that we want students to have an understanding of that can often be fairly complex. Any other ideas that you might be able to think to use these technologies for? Okay, um, so augmented reality is probably the thing that's going to impact upon classrooms the most immediately and particularly as we've got Google Glass coming out now. Um, is everyone aware of what Google Glass is from the brief video clip that I included? So these are pairs of glasses that you wear and uh, projected onto the, the glass of the glasses um, is a computer display and they also have a little camera in them and other things so that you can, um, as you're looking at the real world, you can have information superimposed in front of your vision um, about um, emails that you're receiving or photos that you're taking um, or Facebook updates and things of that nature. So it's a way of, it's an augmented reality technology whereby you're seeing information superimposed on your view of the real world. Now you'll probably have students in your classes wearing these within the year or so. Um, so it's going to be something that teachers will need to come to grips with and obviously there will be a lot of teachers thinking, well there already is, a lot of teachers thinking about how they can incorporate that into their teaching. Um, you might wear them yourself and be able to bring up your lesson plan in front of your eyes as you're teaching, for example. Um, or if you're explaining a particular um, mathematical equation, you can have that in front of your vision as you're explaining it on the board or as you're writing it on the whiteboard you could be viewing it on your screen so instead of having to refer back to a textbook you can have that um, in front of your eyes. So there could be a whole range of different things that you could incorporate. Um, when the fire alarm goes off automatically it might appear on your in your vision the evacuation map and how to get out of the building. Uh, so there could be a, lots and lots of innovative ways that students will be coming up with or people will be coming up with on how to actually utilize these um, augmented reality viewers when they, well they're already available in America now but they're not quite available in Australia just yet. So any thoughts about how you might use um, augmented reality glasses? Well, it could be like a live feed to your schedule and you could uh, be more efficient with your time. Um, I thought of um, maybe in art class as well, you could have uh, a model that's digitally um, projected on, onto your glasses and then you can do the sketching like that. Um, no, absolutely. And there's been a lot of work around the use of augmented reality um, in the teaching of art. And also just in artistic creations. Um, there's been a number of artists that have created artworks that are 40 or 50 stories high. 
Um, you only get to see them when you look through augmented reality uh, viewers, but they are superimposed on the landscape. Um, a lot of architects create their buildings in augmented reality um, so that you, if you walk up to the blank lot that's um, just a construction lot and you put on your glasses, you then see the actual building as it will be completed and you can walk around it. In fact, you can even walk inside it and explore it as a 3D model. Um, so there's lots of interesting artistic applications of augmented reality. Any other thoughts? So how could it make your days more efficient now? Okay, as a students, how might be able to use how might being able to use augmented reality when you came to university to attend a lecture or um, even coming to university might assist? Well, when you first get here, you don't know where any of your classes are, so yep. having a map or something like that projected in front of you would be good. Absolutely. And just like we have augmented reality in our cars with our um, GPS systems showing maps, um, and some of those now project up onto your screens in front of your vision, um, you could have it as you walk around the campus, it would show footsteps showing you where to walk um, and the different paths to take. So instead of it having to even look at a map, you can see an automated pathway showing how to move around various locations. Any other ideas? What about during lectures? Well, yeah, you could look up uh, the lecture notes as you're going along. Yep. You could also use it to record um, what's happening in the lecture and having it saved later. Um, other people could actually view through your eyes. So <laughs> you might be the one selected person from your group to attend the lecture, and everyone else sits at home and watches it through their computer screens watching whatever you look at. Um, so that could be an approach. Any other thoughts? I know it's a bit hard just being the two of you and having all these questions. But <laughs> much nicer if we had a few more students here to <laughs> bounce ideas off. <laughs> okay. Well, let's leave augmented reality and let's start having a look at um, assistive technologies. Unless you've got any other questions about augmented reality that you'd like to ask, or virtual reality. Okay, so does anyone have any experiences with any assistive technologies? So I'm guessing uh, not. Would, <laughs> yes, would, um, would crutches uh, be one of them? It's well, pretty primal. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess they are an assistive technology. Um, probably not quite the digital type of assistive technologies we're exploring right. in this course, but yes, they are an assistive technology. Um, they're designed to assist people that have difficulties with moving around. Um, so. Uh, what sort of assistive technologies can you think of that might be applied to a classroom situation? Okay, well um, one of the those, most... Go on. Those Go on. pens that um, help you read. I know my little brother has one of those. Yep. He's, yeah. <laughs> so you scroll it over the words and... Yeah, and it, the it words says too. what the word is, yeah. Yep, now they're very popular. Um, very common, you'll have headphone loops whereby the teacher will have a little microphone that they hang around their neck and students that have difficulty with hearing will wear headphones and it'll amplify your voice to those students. Um, you see those in lots and lots of primary schools but also some secondary schools because um, you have lots of students that have hearing difficulties and that can often degrade their learning to a great extent. Okay, there's various types of um, reader technologies, as we've talked about. 
Um, particularly with iPads and laptops now, we can have them so that they can read out the text to students. Um, before that, there used to be braille readers and a whole lot of other technologies that used specialized text or um, specialized ways of reading that text. Uh, nowadays, as we've gone more and more digital, that's become less significant, although there's still a lot of material that's done through braille and other technologies that allow students with vision difficulties to be able to read. Um, there's even braille readers whereby you can put in a whole lot of digital text and it's sort of a bit like a reverse typewriter in that um, it, it's sort of like printing out the braille but it's done on a dynamic way so it's not printed, it's just um, made available on a, on a pad that you can then move your hand over and read the text and it changes as it reads through various digital text. Um, so there's, you will have students with various um, special needs in your classrooms during your career and you'll need to make um, accommodations to allow them to engage with the learning. Um, and sometimes that can be very challenging because it often does involve extra work and extra preparation. Um, sometimes you'll receive assistance Sometimes they may have an assistant with them, so the student turns up to your class, but also their um, translator or reader, um, who will then say with sign language, um, they'll listen to you and then sign to the student. Um, some teachers learn sign language themselves, so they can do that themselves with their students, um, and there can be various other approaches. Probably one of the most significant at the moment, as I mentioned in the video, is the need to make website material or digital material accessible to all students. Um, now technologies do make that a lot easier. Uh, once we put things up digitally, there's a lot of technologies that will interpret that and make that available to students with vision or hearing difficulties. But some things do need a bit of extra work, particularly around the use of images and video. Um, having images tagged so that there's a description of the image um, is very important and that can sometimes be very, very difficult, particularly if it's a scientific image or a scientific diagram. Um, having to explain that in text can often be as difficult as writing about the rest of the material. Um, but also with video, there's a need nowadays that if you're using a lot of video in your class, have transcripts of that video so that students who can't see the video can read through the transcript and understand what it's actually um, explaining, or if they can't hear the video, so probably more especially if they can't hear the, hear the narration in the video, they can read through the transcript while they watch the video. Um, but for students with vision difficulties, um, there may be needs for other alternatives to video if you're relying upon that as one of your main learning tools. Um, it's not to say you don't use it, but you do need to make sure that students with particular needs that might be in your classroom uh, can also learn as effectively as students that don't have those particular needs. Any thoughts around that as a concept? Uh, also, uh, interpretive technology for foreign students, that could help? Yes, very good. Um, and a lot of the technologies that have been incorporated into um, special needs students have been also now applied to translations for um, other languages. And we're really getting to a stage now whereby you can have a mobile device that will translate on the fly into just about any other language. Um, so you don't need interpreters and so forth. Now that will pose some interesting challenges in a classroom. Um, some of them good, some of them particularly challenging in respect to the way we have students immerse in, an, in another language. If students are relying upon these translation devices, then there's going to be less um, impetus for them to actually learn the new language. Uh, learn English in this case. Um, so as a transitionary process it's certainly effective um, in allowing them to still engage while retaining their uh, mother language but we could find some challenges around that if that becomes the norm um, and students might progress through their entire schooling without the need to actually learn the language of instruction. Um, so it would be interesting to see how that plays out in the future, whether or not we actually still need to have a reliance upon everyone learning a common language. Um, any other thoughts about assistive technologies that you might have come across or thought about 
might impact your teaching. And remember, for those watching online, you can ask questions on the today's meet. <laughs> okay. Well, you can probably read through the assistive technology stuff at your own leisure. Um, there's a fair bit of text there, but I just wanted you to be aware that there are a whole range of technologies available, and particularly as many of them are related to digital technologies, there will be an expectation that if you've got, if you're fairly comfortable with digital technologies, that you'll also be comfortable with using various assistive technologies. Um, and increasing that expectation will be that you can incorporate the use of these assistive technologies when you have students with special needs in your classrooms. <coughs> well, there's only been a relatively small amount of content this week. Of course, you do probably need to be starting to focus more and more upon your assessment tasks. Um, does anyone have any questions about their assessment? Who's done some of the quizzes? I've done the introduction one. <laughs> okay. Is that it? <laughs> um, I actually have a question on the um, the game analysis. Um, yeah. For that, are we allowed to just like, um, do we write an essay or um, do we do a video or like how do we kind of present um, that? Let me just bring it up. Um, there's different requirements for different activities. But for the basic game analysis one, um, for that one, I would probably do a video yeah. and I would do it as a screen capture. So if you're using an Apple computer, using um, QuickTime Player allows you to capture whatever occurs on the screen. And there's various other tools that you can use on Windows-based machines to capture whatever occurs on your screen. Then you can play the game or engage with the game and do voiceovers while you're doing that, yeah. explaining what you're doing and explaining the various aspects of it. And then you can edit that to make it effectively fit within, I think, three minutes is the maximum I've given you for videos or something like that. Um, so that would be an effective way of explaining that concept. Now you could do it through text and through pictures and so forth, but for a video game or game analysis, I think the most appropriate technology for use for that would be a screen capture. Okay. And then you would upload that to YouTube and then provide the link to that so yep. that when I come to assess it. Yeah. So and are we other... only using um, Portal 2 and Minecraft, was it? Are okay. That was two that I gave options for. Now, was that for later on? That's for the portfolio of learning activities, I think. Let me just find those. Um, yes, for the portal activities, those are two that you can examine in more detail. Um, but next to them, there's also educational game, where you can create your own educational game. But in terms of examining how to use the game and explaining how to use a game in a classroom, um, yes, you can only choose Portal or Minecraft at that level. Um, you can do any game for the for the um, uh, log of learning activities task. Okay? But when you come to do your portfolio of learning task, um, the course of the level of depth you need to go into for that one, um, I've given you two specific games that you can explore. And I've chosen those because they've got a lot of educational resources associated with them that you can investigate and um, incorporate into what you're doing. And that one you do have to do as an annotated seven minute video. Any other questions on any of the assessment? Wouldn't it be great if there were more students here asking questions about the assessment so that they can clarify what they need to do and get high marks? Otherwise, it will just be the two of you getting the high marks. <laughs> Fine with me. <laughs> Absolutely. 
Well, I've probably exhausted your ability to answer questions on these topics, so I think we'll finish up early today, um, and hopefully there'll be more of you here next week um, as we get into some of the other material, and as we start focusing more and more on the assessment tasks. Of course, really, these are your opportunities to clarify these things and to make it a bit easier, but I would encourage you to start getting your port uh, log of learning activities out of the way, getting those quizzes done, particularly while the content for them is still relatively fresh in your mind, um, and getting some of those basic activities out of the way. They shouldn't take that long, um, and that will allow you plenty of time to do your portfolio of learning activities, which are the more significant tasks, and they're the ones that will really differentiate the high distinction and distinction students from the passing and credit students. Um, so if you don't leave yourself enough time to do those at a sufficient level, then you'll still pass the course, no problems, but you won't achieve those highest levels of grades, which I'm sure some of you at least are aiming towards. Okay then, well remember that you can still continue to ask questions on the discussion forums, otherwise I hope to see more of you here next week, and we'll continue our whole course discussions. Bye-bye for Thank now. Thank you. See ya. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.